So here's how we applied this to, to the Coslin study. What we argued happens is that when we looked at his materials closely, it turns out on the false trials, the objects and properties were unassociated words, so otter wall, cherry card, completely unrelated words. And what we thought might be going on is that when you receive a, a, a set of trials like these, that you can simply assess using this first process of when you generate this kind of linguistic form information, you can, set, you can assess whether or not these two words are associated, which they tend to be for the true trials, or unassociated, and simply say true or false based on whether the words are associated or not. In contrast, imagine that we use exactly the same true trials, but we now construct different false trials from the same words where these two words, uh, the, the object and property, are now um, highly associated, but they're false because the, the task is, is this, is this a part, the task was actually, is this a part of this object? But they can no longer use this fast associative process because all these words are highly associated, and so what we would argue they have to do instead is they have to go to the simulation system and see if the property actually exists in the object. So what we, what we predicted was that we should, we should not see size effects in this condition, because they're just using the, these, uh, the associative strength between the words, but we should see size effects in this condition because they're now activating simulations. They can't use the words anymore. We blocked that. And once they start activating simulations, we should see size effects. Can I, can I yes, question? sure. Size effects, do you mean relative size? Um, well, so like basically, uh, because a head is, is larger than a claw, Relative to the object, yeah, within the object's reference frame. Um, and, and there's a whole bunch about this that I can, I, I'm trying to avoid getting into. I mean, but basically, um, but, but basically, the, the, his original finding was that the, the relative size of the properties mattered under some conditions, but not under others. And, um, and that's kind of the same thing we're arguing here, that we won't see any kind of size effect in this condition, but we'll see it in this condition. And that's, um, that's exactly what we found. With the unrelated false trials, there was no size effect. It seemed like people were using information about the associative strength between the words. Um, with the related false trials, they could no longer use this information because all the, all the, uh, both the true and the false trials had associative relations between the objects and concepts, so objects and properties. So they now had to, we, uh, our argument goes, they would have to activate simulations, and now size should matter. Um, we replicated this experiment here at Penn with Sharon Thompson Schill. This was my first neuroimaging experiment. I one of her former students, Irene Kahn. And um, basically, we just, uh, we just uh, manipulated whether the false trials were related or unrelated. And Sharon had been doing work on, on, on visual imagery at the time with Mark Esposito and had been finding when you generate uh, an image of something from a concrete word that there's a certain fusiform area active on the left. And so Sharon just drew an ROI around the, 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 the peak voxel in those previous studies, and we just uh, assessed that ROI in this experiment as a function of manipulating the false trials. And what we found was when the false trials were um, related, uh, there was activation in the same area that they had found, but when the false trials were unrelated, there was no activation. So um, basically, uh, uh, what this suggested to us, that both the behavioral and the neural evidence suggests that we can push around people's, the strategy people are using to verify properties of concepts as a function of the task conditions. And on the one hand, they can, they can assess whether kind of a property is true of an object just by seeing whether the words are associated, if that information is diagnostic for a correct response. If it's not, and we force them to do semantic processing, going to the conceptual representation, then we see a size effect which suggests that the conceptual representation is a simulation. So the, the, what you're suggesting here is that they can't do the property verification task, right, for the, um, for the related in a related condition without simulation. Exactly. So if it were okay, so exactly it prevent simulation, it would impede. Exactly. And, and can I ask one, one other? Sure. So is it, I mean, your words sound like you're saying that sort of linguistic association is a different thing, but in another frame, which actually would seem more like where you should be coming from, 
that it's a very, very, very partial simulation, i.e. that it is the context in which you hear a bunch of words together and nothing else? We think at this point that it's, it, it, well, we think of, the, of, of words, that, like when you're generating those words, that you're actually simulating those words, you know, so it's like, I mean, you can think of like word production as a kind of simulation process, a simulation of hearing a word or producing a word, but we, but we don't actually, but we don't think that the much meaning is being generated at, at, the, at this early stage, and if you're interested, there are some papers where we talk about kind of, we think what we generally think is going on is that there are mixtures of these two pro processes, as is kind of illustrated here, that you generally have both of these things taking place, but then the executive system focuses in on the output of one or the other, primarily to make a response. Um, and that over the course of the task, it kind of figures out which of those two sources of information is most important. But for the linguistic, we pretty much just ling mean linguistic forms. And I think there's a fair amount of evidence in the literature to support that. If you're interested, there's a section on my website of papers on language and simulation, and there's a review paper that reviews our evidence and other people's evidence. But I, what's really, and this was very counterintuitive to us at the time, people can, and, and I bring this up because I think it's really in, important for neuropsych neuropsychological tests. I think people can perform a lot of tasks just using kind of heuristic-like linguistic strategies without activating a lot of meaning. And I think people often, often assume that in many of these tests that deep meaning is getting activated, but I don't think that's necessarily true. And I think these kinds of experiments and some of the review papers that I was just mentioning um, kind of point to a lot of cases where people can kind of do very superficial processing of meaning and still do reasonably well on the task. And when you really force, when you block that kind of strategy, you often see very different behavior and very different processing. And that's consistent with, I think, a lot of our results. So um, I think maybe I'm going to skip these experiments, these next two experiments. We then kind of, based on these initial experiments, actually did some more careful a priori tests of this theory where we basically, what this experiment shows is that when you have people just producing features, spontaneously, that you get features coming from the linguistic system first, followed uh, by features coming from the simulation system. It, so if, you, if, you, if you're studying people who are generating features, um, we're increasingly confident that the first features are coming from something like a word association process, and that, this behavioral study supports that. And we also did a, a we, we ran these two studies together. They were companion experiments. We did a neuroimaging experiment. We found the same thing in the neuroimaging experiment that the first information produced seems to be coming from a word association kind of a, a process, and that later features are coming more from a simulation process. So again, it kind of supports this idea that when you access a concept, you're not just getting one kind of information, you're getting multiple kinds of information um, coming out. So basically, the summary of this work is that there seem to be two, at least two system central conceptual tasks, linguistic processing of linguistic forms and situated simulation, the roles of these systems are modulated by task conditions, and the time courses vary. When you give people words, you're going to initially get other linguistic form information, and then simulation will start coming out a little bit later. Okay, now what I want to do is um, take these ideas and apply them to abstract concepts. And basically, kind of our take on with the abstract concepts literature is that, is that the abstract concepts are usually studied under shallow task conditions, with linguistic stimuli, and as a result, most of the results that have been reported in both the behavioral and neural literatures reflect largely the generation of word associates, and just like in those kinds of experiments I was telling you about a moment ago. And they haven't really looked at, it, the tasks haven't been designed to get at kind of more simulation-based um, kinds of representations. And so the last thing I want to show you, just very quickly, are three examples of recent work that we've done where we, we give people deep processing situated con condi task conditions, and we show that you get very different results from the ones, like the one I, the, from the Binhurst paper that I showed you earlier. In fact, we don't see anything like those results um, when, when, you, when you give people a different, different task conditions. So I showed you this study earlier where we found kind of simulation-based evidence for motion and location words. We also included mental state words, like distressed and pleasing, and we found classic mental state areas active in medial prefrontal. As if, you, uh, if you actually had people processing their own mental states or other people's mental states, this is the kind of area you'd see active. If you give people words for these, for these kinds of states, it activates these areas, suggesting that people are simulating um, kind of the meaning of these words. They're not just generating left hemisphere kind of language responses, they're simulating what the words are about. 
this is a study with a current graduate student, Christy Wilson. Uh, also, Kyle Simmons and Alex Martin uh, w w were collaborators. And in this experiment, we studied two abstract concepts, many trials in each, so we could get detailed um, activation profiles for each of these, convince and arithmetic. And the way, that, the way that we got kind of deep situated processing was they received a word for five seconds and then a picture, and um, then they had to say whether or not this, this word correctly described what was happening in the picture. And um, we used a methodology that allowed us to deconvolve the activations for the word from the activations for the picture, because all we care about are the activations for the word, what's representing the semantics of the concept. And what we predicted was that if people are running simulations to represent the semantics of these abstract concepts, then for convince, because convince is about mental states, and it's also very social, we should see simulations taking place of mental states and also other areas associated with social processing. Uh, in contrast, for arithmetic, because arithmetic is about number, there's been a lot of work where you actually have people process number in a scanner. We know, for example, that IPS is important for processing number in other parietal areas, so we predicted um, that uh, when people process arithmetic, IPS should become active because people are simulating number processing. And that's what we found. So we actually used localizers to localize areas associated with thought. Um, we also used a, 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 a number processing localizer, and what we found there's a lot of details I'm just going to skim over in the interest of time, but the localizers in the lighter color and the, and the, and the concepts for convince and arithmetic are in the darker colors. Basically, there are eight, I think there were ten areas active in the thoughts localizer, and eight of them um, convince had significant activation relevant, relative to arithmetic. In contrast for um, arithmetic, uh, it's not shown here, but uh, bilateral IPS was active when people received arithmetic suggesting that they're simulating the processing of number in some sense to represent um, the concept of arithmetic. In general, the, you do not see left hemisphere activations for convincing arithmetic. If anything, we had some concrete concepts in this experiment. I'm not telling you about there are more activations in those areas for the concrete concepts. And as I mentioned earlier, there are more activations all over the brain for convincing arithmetic, especially convince, um, consistent with these concepts being com complex. The last study, uh, this has also been done with Christy Wilson and an emotion researcher, Lisa Feldman Barrett, and again, Kyle Simmons. And we're looking at four concepts in this experiment, each presented many times, observe, plan, fear, and anger. I'm just going to show you the results for observe. There's a situational manipulation here to show that, these, uh, the, the, that each of these concepts is, produces very different activations as a function of the situation in which it's processed. I'm going to skip over those results. And, just show you the key things having to do with simulation. So these are areas that are more active for observe relative to the combination of fear and anger. And from a simulation perspective, what you might think is involved in observing something is that when you observe like a room, for example, you're using your visual system, your auditory system. And so from a simulation perspective, you're kind of using your visual and auditory system. So what you might expect to see when people are processing the word observe is that visual and auditory areas become active. And that's what we see. We see both um, ventral stream and dorsal stream visual areas, and then bilateral auditory areas um, becoming active for observe relative to these two emotion concepts. So basically, all three of these examples suggest that when you have people process abstract concepts in more challenging, deep processing, situated conditions, that you get very different results than have been previously reported in the literature. Um, consistent with the idea that people are pr representing them in terms of the relevant situations uh, that would occur if you were actually um, experiencing an instance of the concept.